Come on, lift your hands all across this room and give Jesus some praise. Come on, 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 not for a man, but for Jesus. I said for Jesus. If he saved you, if he's touched you, if he's delivered you, if you're not an addict anymore, if you've been set free by the power of God, that would be a great place to give Jesus some praise. The Bible says it like this. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. Praise is an invaluable weapon that God has given to you to destroy the works of the enemy in your life. Sometimes the only thing you need for victory is a praise. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. In other words, watch this. God does not give you praise for to help you just feel better. In other words, you praising God right now is not about what you can get out of the moment. If it was about you, then you would have to praise yourself and not God. See, I didn't come in this room to praise me because I couldn't do what... No, y'all ain't saying nothing. I didn't come in this room to praise me. I, I have nothing to offer that God would really want to use, but there's something about Him tapping His divinity into my humanity that makes me do what I said I could never do. It takes me places I said I could never go. When God begins to touch my life with who He is, it makes something swell up on the inside of me that says, thank you, Jesus. Praise you, God. Now, I wish I had some praises that understood the way Weapons of your warfare are not carnal, but they are for the uplifting. But that's only half the verse. For the weapons of warfare are not carnal, but they're mighty in pulling down. God says, the only reason I asked you to lift it up so that you could pull it down. The real reason you're praising God right now is because there are some things in your life that said that they would not leave you alone. There are some devils that said you'll be like this for the rest of your life. There are some things that said they won't be moved and can't be moved and don't try to touch me because I'm going to be here since you were a little girl and a little boy all the way to the day you die. But the devil is a liar in this room for the weapons of our warfare are not carnal but they are mighty and pulling down strong Holes. Do you not know in this room that every time you praise God, every time you reach up, something is being pulled down. So why don't you take 60 seconds, reach up with your praise, and yank down every work of the devil. Somebody lift it up and praise God right now. You got 50 seconds to rip down every lie, to rip down every false prophecy, to rip down every issue, to rip down every generational curse, to rip down everything that the devil said, to rip down sickness, pain, and disease. Rip it down. Tear it down. Tear it down. You got 20 seconds. We're reaching up to pull it down. I'm pulling it down. Ten seconds. Now prophesy over yourself. We say something. Something is changing. Something is shifting. We say something's changing in the spirit. Something's breaking. I can feel it. Heaven, come down. One more time in this room. 
Come on, reach up and tear it down with your worship. Something's changing in the spirit. Something's breaking. I can feel it. Heaven, come down. Heaven, come down. Now somebody give God the greatest praise you've given him all weekend long. And tear something down. Tear something down. Tear something down. I'm trying to get off this, but I hear you, Holy Ghost. Tear something down. Mess something up. Rip something apart. I don't know what you're staring at me for. I, I told you that you can tear it down yourself. You don't have to wait for a preacher. You don't have to wait for, uh, come on y'all. You don't have to wait for a reverend or a prophet or an apostle. You can rip it down yourself. I don't know what has been sitting over top of your life, but you can tear it down right now. I want you to slip up your hands to heaven. I don't know what has to come down. But there are, there are some things that have stood in your way too long. The Bible says, Jesus said, say to this mountain, be removed. He didn't say, ask me to say to the mountain. He said, I've already given you everything you need to say something to the mountain so that the mountain will be removed, not at a preacher's voice, not at a worship leader's voice, but at your voice, you can move the mountain. So this last little worship, this last little praise, I want you to say to your mountain, say to the obstruction, say to the hindrance. I want you to speak so that it has to remove itself. Isn't that awesome how God would give you the kind of power? He says, say that, and it will be removed. In other words, the minute you start talking, it picks itself up and says, we got to go. There ain't no arguing with it. Come on, y'all ain't saying nothing to me. You don't have to argue with it. You don't have to beg it to leave. You don't have to sit in it and yell at it. When you start using your faith and your authority that God has already put on the inside of you, that mountain will pick itself up and cast itself into the sea. You got 30 seconds right here to tear something down, to say to your mountain, be removed. Somebody do it right now. Say to your mountain. that we understand that we are seated in heavenly places. God, to stop arguing with and start speaking over. God, that we would step into the things that you have called us to step into, not by might, not by power, but by your spirit. And Father, I'll give you praise for it all. In Jesus' name, if you believe it, somebody shout amen. amen. I, I want you to grab your Bibles while you're standing. It's, it's just my custom, just my custom. How, Mama, did we have some church last night? I don't know about you, but I'm in recovery. I'm getting everything back that the enemy stole from me. And, uh, praise God. I thank God for, once again, this worship team, this staff, and your lead pastors, that they can operate in such a way that meets your needs while making sure God's needs are met at the same time. Because how many know God has needs? The need to be praised, the need to be loved. He wants to be loved by you. That is the chief end of man, that we would love God with all of our heart, with all of our soul, our strength. 
and uh, I'm excited to preach all day today. I'm, I'm, I'm not going to lie, I'm locked and loaded. I'm feeling real dangerous right now, so. <laughs> feeling real dangerous. To the online audience, we welcome you in. Uh, pray that you receive. To my wife, who's probably watching, I love you, I miss you, and uh, I'll see you soon. I got work to do, though. I want you to open up your Bibles to the book of Jeremiah, chapter 18. And this morning, if it's okay with you, I would just like to preach the sequel to last night. I, I told your pastors that I felt like this weekend, especially the first two days tonight, now I'm, I'm, you need to come tonight because I've got a prophetic word for this house that is a download from God. In fact, I don't know if I've ever gotten more a more significant revelation in the last year or so than this, what I'm about to preach tonight. You need to be here. But, but this morning and last night, God told me that he wanted to minister to you. That sometimes... As, lay, as, as ministers, we forget that the laity of a church, we get to come back to the bubble called revival. We get to come back into this. But sometimes we, we don't always understand that, that the minute you leave this, all hell is sitting at your doorstep when you pull in your driveway. That, that, that tomorrow you're going to walk into a workplace where some people didn't have the encounter you had. Yep. And that you face real issues with real people and have real pain and real problems. And I think God was so mindful of you that he sent me here on this assignment, at least the first two services, to minister to the recesses of those issues in your life, not just to give you prophecy, but to give you promise. How many are ready to receive that promise this morning? <laughs> Jeremiah chapter 18. I want, it's a popular passage of scripture, but I want to preach in a way pray, uh, that I pray you've never heard. Four verses is all I need, and then we're going to go to work. This is what God's word says. Are you ready? The word which came to Jeremiah from the Lord saying, Arise and go down to the potter's house, and there I will cause you to hear my words. Then I went down to the potter's house, and there he was making something at the wheel. And the vessel that he made of clay was marred in the hand of the potter. So he made it again into another vessel, as it seemed good to the potter to make. I really want to sit down. I, I, I read four verses, but I really only need one. I, re, I really only need one. I want, to, I want to zero in. I want to sit down in verse three this morning. Then I went down to the potter's house, and there he was making something. I'm not sure what I'm going to be, but one thing I do know, he's making I know it doesn't look like nothing, but by the end, he's going to make. I know it doesn't feel like he's working, but I promise you by the end of it, he's making something at the wheel. It is my assignment very briefly this morning to preach to you a message God told me to tell you. A promised message, he said, to tell you that he didn't pick you up then to let you go now. If you're ready for this word, slip up your hands, Father. I feel you in this place. I sense your glory. We came to hear from you. Speak loudly. Speak profoundly. Speak exactly. Lord, I pray with precision of thought and precision of speech, God. Let me preach your word with power, Lord. Let it be like dynamite. Let it blow up every work of the devil, Lord. I thank you for the anointing. Now, God, I pray, Lord, do as you wish and do as you will. Have your way, and I'll give you praise for it all. And if you believe it this morning, somebody give God one final praise as you're seated. You may be seated. Why don't you just touch two people say, he didn't pick you up then to let you go now. Mm -hmm. My friends, if you have spent any time around you or if you've heard me for any length of time, there is one thing that you have to understand about the preacher that stands in front of you. For the preacher that stands in front of you is enamored with the word of God. I wonder if there's anybody in this room that loves the word of God. And that was all right for about 12 of you. I said, is there anybody in the room that loves the word of God? 
I love the word of God for many reasons, but perhaps I love the word of God because I'm realizing that the more and more I live life, the more I live life, the more I need the word. Because life has a way of taking some things out of you, from taking the breath out of you. But I love the fact that the more I read the word of God, that the more I lay my head on Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the less I'll ever have to lay my head on some psychiatrist's chair somewhere. Because the word of God is not just some answer, it's the answer for my life. I love the fact that when life begins to take from me and pull out of me, I can lay my head on the book and the book will breathe back what life took out. I love the word of God. I love the word of God for many reasons. I love the word of God because the word of God is real. No, not, not just real as in truthful. Real is in the fact that it doesn't mind showing you that God will take ordinary people to do extraordinary things. Uh, uh, you get too quiet on me this morning. I said, I said, God uses his word to show us that he will take messed up, jacked up. Y'all ain't saying nothing. He'll take people with issues and pain and problems, and he'll take ordinary, put his supernatural on it, and let ordinary become extraordinary for his purpose. See, see, you can't praise God in this room for that unless you lived your whole life perfect. But if there are some people in this room that understand that you haven't always been perfect, and you haven't always had it together, and you haven't always done the right thing, and made the right decision but yet despite your decision God used you anyway somebody ought to give him praise that he used me anyway no 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 you're not praising God see see I'm looking for some real people not some churchy folks that understand that if God had not moved in my life I would still be addicted I would still be in pain I would still have an issue but somewhere along the way he still saw what no one saw Praise God, the word of God will let me know God will take one. And that's good news for somebody in the room that's feeling awfully ordinary. See, see, sometimes you can come into church and be convinced that if you're not anointed, you can't be used. And if you're not doing that, you can't be used. But the devil is a liar because greatness doesn't start at greatness. Greatness starts as ordinary. Before God ever pushes you to the platform and to the front row, greatness often starts on the back seat somewhere. <laughs> the word of God is powerful. Hidden inside of it are stories of ordinary men who God used in extraordinary ways. Men, men like the man in our text. One of my favorite characters in God's word, the prophet Jeremiah. I love Jeremiah. I love Jeremiah for a lot of reasons, but, but I love Jeremiah because he's balanced. He, he's so balanced that in one part of the text, he says, it's like fire shut up in my bones. He said he was Pentecostal. Because you only say things like fire shut up in my bones if you're Pentecostal. Amen. Amen. Uh, he, in one moment, he, he's been a car, he, fire shut up in my bones. But then in another, in another book, in Lamentations, he's crying all the time. He's balanced. He knows how to be fiery and passionate, yet sensitive all at the same time. Hmm. See, that's what you need in your life. You need some balance. Oh, can I do this? <laughs> I, you, you need some balance. You need to know how to worship God fervently, but also love your kids. I'll sow a seed. Amen. You need to know how to pray fervently but love your wife. You need to be a man of God, but you also need to know how to be a shoulder for somebody else to cry on. See, sometimes what hinders a move of God is the fact that we are so fiery and we go up the mountain so often that we cannot be touched by the feelings of somebody's infirmity. Let me tell you what makes Jesus great is that Jesus is up there, but he also came down here to be touched. So he knows both worlds. And because he knows both worlds, he knows divinity and anointing and power, but he also knows how to cry over something. He knows how to be sensitive. He knows how to weep with those who weep. I'm preaching better than you're letting on. And rejoice with those that rejoice. He knows the balance. Sometimes greatness is not getting something out. Sometimes greatness is adding something in to bring balance. Mm. Jeremiah is balanced. But let me tell you the real reason I love Jeremiah. Am I helping anybody so far? I love Jeremiah because anytime you read Jeremiah or Lamentations, there is a phrase that always flies through the text. 
it always starts off with the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah. He didn't go unless he had a word. Oh. Jeremiah said, I will be the kind of man that does not move unless you tell me. I'm going to sit up right here and I'm going to be faithful to what you told me to do. Y'all ain't saying nothing. I'm going to be faithful. I'm going to be right where you need me to be, doing what you said to do, how you said to do it. And if you didn't say move, I'm not going to make it happen. Y'all ain't saying nothing. I'm not going to make it happen. I'm not going to push for it to happen. I'm not going to strive for it to happen. If I don't have a word for it, I'm going to stay planted right here because I know you love me enough that when the time and the season is right, you will send the word. And when you send the word, it's my permission to make a move. No, 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 no. You, you can't date without a word. You can't take a job without a word. You can't do it your own thing without a word. If God didn't give you a word for it, don't move into it, baby, because the last thing you need is to get pain over something God didn't promise. Your joy or your pain is dependent upon if you move or don't move with or without a word. Which means you're going to have to pray a little more than what you've been praying. Because I always know when you're moving in your strength, because you probably haven't talked to God about it. Because God is eager to see you get to your destiny just as much as you are. And the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah. Do you see the mercy and the grace of God? To say, I will keep you where you are, but when it's time to move, I'll always send a word. Can I go deeper? Y'all pulling on me. <laughs> Let me tell you why God sends a word. Because he sends a word as a part of your calling. When God calls you, he does not call you from your present. He calls you from your destiny. If he didn't call you from your destiny, why would we call it a calling? When God starts to speak to you, he always speaks from the place that he is calling you to. The calling is an invitation to come, which means there is no obstruction on the road that he has already made a way. And the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah as a sign that Jeremiah, the highway is open. There is no tolls. There are no wrecks. There haven't been any collisions. Come on, Jeremiah. There's another level for you to get to. And the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah. Jeremiah sitting in one place. And when the word comes, it comes like this. Jeremiah, I know you've been prophesying. I know you've been preaching. I know you've been doing my work. But I got a, I got a new sermon. There's something new I want you to see. Something new. Today's message, Jeremiah, is not going to be one that you see on paper. Today's an illustrated sermon, Jeremiah. Because I want you to go down to the potter's house. And I want you to watch the potter. And as you see the potter make, you will get the sermon for your life. And Jeremiah goes down to the potter's house. He takes a seat in the congregation. And all of a sudden, God takes the pulpit. And begins to, by the way, nobody can preach like God. Now, now, I know you're trying to get your stuff from Facebook and Twitter and Instagram, and you're trying to get your special quote, but, but, but eat stain master for about two hours, and you'll find out what God really sounds like. Because sometimes God doesn't come in a quote. Y'all ain't saying nothing. God doesn't come in your favorite devotion. Sometimes God only comes when you spend intimate time with him. Jeremiah said, I know that that other stuff was good, but speak now. And the sermon begins. And when Jeremiah looks out of the corner of his eye, can I do this? The potter gets up and he watches as he walks out of his house and he walks over to a messy, muddy, murky, nasty, 
deliberate and dirty field. And when he gets over to the field, his eyes get fixed on something. While everyone is passing by and picking flowers and taking fruit, the potter is not enamored with, with what has already bloomed. His eyes are not fixed what has already come to fruition. But his eyes are fixed on a mess. Oh, y'all ain't saying nothing. His eyes are fixed on a dirty, nasty field that everybody else would walk by and say there's nothing of value and there's nothing that could be used. See, the potter has a way of seeing what nobody else can see when they look at you. And the potter fixes his eyes and reaches down and picks up a lump of mud. If I don't preach another word, I've already preached right there. Because I am thankful for the day that he, that he picked me up. Oh. I said, I am thankful for the day that he picked me up. I wonder if I'm in a church this morning with some folks that realize you couldn't pick yourself up. You couldn't get yourself out. You weren't worth anything and nobody liked you and you were a mess. But somewhere along the way, God reached down in your mess and he picked <sighs> Somebody ought to give him praise right now for the day he picked you up. No, 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 no. That's that religious praise. I'm talking about some people that understand you should still be there. You should still be a mess. You should be in a mental hospital. You should be broke down, broke and disgusted. But God reached down and picked you up. Somebody give him glory right now. Do you not realize that if, that if he never did another thing for you, that, that if he never blessed you again, if you, if you never got another paycheck, if you, if, you never, if you never had another thing that he did to bless your life, what he did in that moment by picking you up was enough for you to praise him for the rest of your life. So if you see me shouting and dancing and praising God and going crazy, don't mind me. I'm just going back to the day that he found me and he raised me and he picked me up. See, I always know the people that have been through some stuff. Because anytime you start talking about being picked up, they can't help but jump up on their feet. They don't care if their makeup smears. They don't care if their tie comes undone. Because they know they shouldn't even be here right now. But somewhere along the way, God loved them enough to pick them up. And they'll be forever grateful. And they won't care about what you think about them. And they won't care what you say about them. They're your God. Their praise is not predicated on your opinion. God picked them up. And he deserves the glory. Now somebody give him a shout of praise right now for the day he picked you up. Be seated. He picked me up. Oh, he picked me up. Oh, you should have seen me before he picked me up. I wasn't nothing to look at. I, I wasn't anything anybody wanted to be around, but he still picked me up. I could preach that all day. Jeremiah watches as he picks him up, picks it up, and then the potter begins to walk with it. Because isn't that like God? He doesn't pick you up to set you back down. He picks you up to take you into places you've never been. See, this is the difference between God and everything the enemy throws at your life. Because can we be real for a second? The enemy does have a way of picking you up. See how quiet it just got? No. I, I, can, I can make no argument that alcohol will pick you up. I can make no argument that drugs will pick you up or else we wouldn't call it getting high. Amen. I can make no argument that a one night stand might fill a temporal need. But the problem with everything that the enemy ever throws at you is that when it picks you up, it always sets you right back. 
it sets you right back down in your mess. That's why when you get drunk, you feel hungover. When you get high, you have to come back down. When you have the one night stand, you feel guilty. Why? Because the enemy said, I will try to imitate what God does for his people, but use it for their destruction. But how many know that when God gets a hold of your life, he picks you up, but he never sets you back down. He picks you up and says, from this moment forward, it's only higher, it's only greater, it's only deeper. If you're thankful, somebody ought to give him praise right now. I guess what I'm trying to tell somebody who's been trying to figure out this Christianity thing is, I've been trying to tell you that what God has for you is greater than what the enemy gives to you. That God has a better life, abundant life, if you believe it, say amen. Amen. Be seated. Oh, I feel the anointing of God. Uh, uh, The potter says, I want to walk with you. I want to walk with you. Can you see the conversation between the potter and the mud and the clay? You don't even know what you're going to be. Just keep walking with me. Just trust me. Just just, just have a little faith. I promise I ain't going to hurt you. I, I know they hurt you, but I'm not them. I know what they did to you last time they picked you, but, but I'm not that. I, I only have good plans. I, I have plans for you to prosper, plans for you to succeed. I, I got plans to bring you to an expected end. I know it don't look like much now. I know it doesn't seem like anything's happening, but please know you are in my hand. <laughs> and if you are in my hand, I will bring to pass and perform the word over your life. And he walks with what he picked up. But it's in this part of the process of making something at the wheel that I got confused because in the next part of the text, in the next part of the process, something crazy happened. Because when the potter grabbed it, I understood. When he walked with it, it made sense. But then he does something crazy by taking the mud and the clay into his house. I, I grew up, I grew up with a, um, let me see how I want to say this. I grew up with a very spiritual mama. My mom wasn't Pentecostal. My mom was Pentecostal. <laughs> I, I can remember me and my friends, you know, they weren't saved. Me and my friends be getting ready to leave the house. she say, where y'all going? I say, out. she say, sit down, all of you. She say, lift your hands. <laughs> My unsafe friends looking at me like, I don't know, what's she doing? I said, she smokes stuff. She, she's doing stuff. I don't know. And she would look at all of us and she would say, I plead the blood. <laughs> now that's spiritual. My mama had them go-go gadget arms in church, sitting three rows in front, still get hit in the back of the head. I said, I don't know how you did it. Stop talking. Amen. <laughs> my mama, my mama was a little out there. She was a, she was a little, little just intense when it came to God. But, but, but my mom had one rule at home. One of the biggest rules she had at home was she wanted to keep her house clean. And I can remember her sending us outside and it'd be raining and we would be out there stomping in the puddles and, you know, eating the mud and doing all that crazy stuff that kids do. But I can remember trying to run back inside after being outside. And the moment I get to the door, like a ghost, she would (laughs) stop. She'd say, what's our rule? You know our rule. I don't want any dirt in my house. Because in most houses, you don't want the dirt to come in. In most houses, it's not appropriate to let the dirt in. It's only what is clean that can come in the house. But what is it about the potter that he doesn't mind having a mess in his house? Oh, are you hearing? What is it about God that he doesn't mind having a mess come up in his house? He don't have to be perfect to walk up in this church. He don't have to have it all together to get into his presence. In fact, if you're broken, come. If you got issues, come. If you're addicted, come. If you have problems, come. If you had affairs, come. If you had issues, come. The potter says, I ain't intimidated by your dirt. Whosoever will, let him come. Somebody ought to give him praise that you 
you got in when you didn't deserve it. See, you might have been denied at the club. You might have been denied at the party. You might not have been led into circles as a high schooler or in school. But God has a way of inviting you into his family. No matter where you've been or what you've done, you better give him praise that he left you into his house. And word up, fresh start. If you want God to move... You got to be okay with God letting a mess in his house. I'm going to let that sit right there in your spirit. We want growth, but keep the dirty people out. Well, what is this place? A country club or a hospital for the broken? What is this place for them? What is it if the homosexual can't come? What is it if the adulteress can't come? What is this place if the sick can't come? The devil is a liar. Whosoever will, let him come. Oh, I feel that in my spirit. <laughs> I rebuke every religious mindset that says you got to be perfect and you got to be clean. The devil is a liar. Let him come, baby. Let him come. In fact, why don't you just give God praise for every dirty thing that's about to walk up in this place and find the hand of the potter on their life. No, no, no. That, that means some of you, your ex-husband's going to get saved. For some of you, your ex-wife is going to get saved. For some of you, that person that's been bothering you. For some of you, that jacked up boss is about to get saved. Let them come, Lord. Let them come. We're okay with it. I'm preaching in this room whether you like it or not today because some of you are trying to put restrictions about what God can save but God said I don't need you to try to help me figure out who can be saved my son already said it it is finished let them all come black white Hispanic let them all come there is room in the house Uh, one more time, if you're ready for a harvest like you have never seen, you ought to give God praise right now for, about, uh, for what's about to walk in this house. Let them come. God, we're praising you now as a sign that it's all right. You can bring whoever, however. Whew, glory to God. Be seated. Uh, and he brought it into the house. The moment you get religious is the moment you have failed to remember. Religion wants you to forget where you came from. Because I cannot judge you if I'm always being grateful about what he did for me. Selah. And he brings it into his house. Can I go deeper? And Jeremiah is watching intently as the master communicator, the master preacher is preaching an illustrated sermon. And he notices that the potter comes in and takes the clay into his house, but then he sets it right in the center of his wheel. Don't miss it. Not his W-H-E-E-L. But right in the center of his W-I-L-L. -L. See, that's, this is for somebody who just got to the church and said, can I be used? And how long do I got to wait to plug in? And when should, I, when should I get involved? See, no, no, no. When God picks you up and brings you into his house, immediately he says, it's time for you to do something. So everybody out there who's not serving and not giving your all and not tithing, the devil is a liar. When God brought you in, it was go time because you're right now in the center of his will. God does not call the qualified. He qualifies. Some of you would be shocked at what God would do if you would do something. I know y'all ain't saying nothing. All the first time guests, I promise it gets better. 
But you would be shocked at what God could do if you would just do something. How can you expect God to do everything and you never do anything? Bless me. Lord, help me do it. That is the mindset of babies. I need everything. If you're going to grow, you, the way I know you've grown is by what you can do for you. I know you're growing by what you can do for yourself. I didn't wake up at the hotel and get breakfast and my mom show up down there and say, now open wide. You're laughing, but that's some of you in the spirit. Spoon feed me, pastor. Spoon feed me, worship. If it's not the song, if it's not my favorite sermon, if it's not real fiery, I don't... The devil is a lie. You got to grow up in this room. If you want to see the next level, God will only give you more when you show him you can do some more for the kingdom of God. You would be shocked at what God could do if you did something. Help me, Jesus. And he said it right in the center of his way. Am I helping anybody this morning? And it started spinning. See, the cause and effect of being in the center of his will is that sometimes when you get right where he wants you to be, life will start spinning. Isn't it amazing how when you were out there in the world, you were kind of the master of your own destiny? But what is it about when you really get on fire for God? Now, I'm talking to real people for a second. Uh, maybe it's just me. Maybe it's just Pastor Josh. Uh, but, but, but every time I seem to go to another level, life seems to start spinning. Out of control. My mama will get cancer. My daddy will leave. I got uncles dying. I got issues happening. And all of a sudden, they start talking about me. And they start wondering. And they start leaving me. And all the friends I thought I needed start walking away from me. And it seems like life is doing nothing but spinning, 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 spinning out of control. Let me tell you why it spins out of control. Because out in the world, you weren't a threat. If you want life to stay nice and easy, and you want life to be perfect, just get out there in the world. The devil will leave you alone and destroy you, and, kill, and you'll be all right. But, but, but if, you want, if you want greatness, you're going to have to get on the wheel and say, okay. And having done all to stand stand. I'm going to put my roots down somewhere and I'm going to say if you got to spin it, spin it. But I ain't moving anywhere. I'm not going anywhere. You ain't going to see me leaving the church. I ain't leaving my prayer closet. I ain't leaving deep worship. I'm going to get there and I'm going to stay there no matter how much it spins in my life. Just look at two people and say let it spin. Let it spin. Let it spin. Let them, let them talk about you. Let them say that about you. Let them get behind your back and do something. Let them leave you and walk away. Let them push you away. The devil is a lie. God has something greater because what the enemy meant for evil, God meant for good. Do you not know in this room that when a potter wants to make something, he needs the spin? I don't think you heard what I just told you. See, the enemy, oh, could it be that God is using the devil to build your life? For all the note takers, I'm going to say that again. Could it be that God is using the devil to build your life? Do you realize that the devil, oh, y'all, the devil can only do what God gives him permission. Let, let, me, let me tell you what it really looks like. It looks like, the, it looks like Sparky on a chain. He can only go as far as I let the chain go. So when I'm trying to work something in your life because you won't get there yourself, I'll turn him loose. 
But when it comes time for you to when you have learned and when you have moved and when you have grown, God will yank the chain on that joker and pull him back to where he needs to be because he's got all authority in his hands. Could it be that God is using the enemy to build your life? Let it spin because as it was spinning, I have been molding and making and shifting and changing your life. If you're grateful, somebody give him glory right now. Just touch two more people. Say, let it spin, baby. Let it spin. Touch your wife. Touch your husband. Say, let it spin. Let it spin. Let it. I know the finances are crazy, but it's going to work out. I know the kids are going crazy, but it's going to work out. I know the job is going crazy, but it's all going to work out. God is working all things together for my good. Who I feel the anointing of God in here. Spinning. 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 Why would God let it spin? Why does God let it spin? Why does the enemy make it spin? And why does God let it spin? Let me put it to you like this. Bag ladies don't get robbed. That woke somebody up. Wait, what? I don't understand. Bag ladies don't get robbed. I have traveled all over the world. I have been all over the world. I have preached in many places, and sometimes they, the service gets out late. And when the service gets out late, you got to find whatever food you can find. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> and I have been some places, and I have accidentally taken some wrong turns. Amen. And, and when I've taken some wrong turns, I have sat at some stoplights and been scared to death. You ever been scared to death at a stoplight? <laughs> Come on, this is Sunday morning. We can laugh a little bit. Don't lie, don't lie in this room. You have been scared at a stoplight before. You know how when you click in the door, but you're still looking forward? Hope, hoping the person outside didn't hear you click it. Shh, don't look, don't look, don't look, don't look. Straight ahead. I, I have been in some situations like that, and right in the middle of my fear, I have seen a bag lady walking down the street like nothing's wrong. You know what I realized? You know why she's not afraid? Because she's got nothing to steal. See, what you don't understand is the minute that God began to make you a vessel, he also had some treasure. And God puts treasure in earthen vessels and the enemy knows that he can't attack the treasure so he says I gotta just make their life spin because the object of the enemy is if he can't touch you he tries to get you to give up Just touch your neighbor and say, if you don't quit, you can't be stopped. Just touch somebody and declare, if you don't quit, you can't be. I feel the Holy Ghost right there. I want to tell somebody, if you don't quit, the devil can't stop you. If you don't quit, no demonic force can hold you down. If you don't give up, give in or give out, it belongs to you. If you believe it, give God some praise right now. Uh, hallelujah. Let me finish this thing. Let me finish this thing. Y'all okay? Y'all getting some stuff out of this? God's about to move in this room. Whew. Jeremiah is watching this illustrated sermon come to pass. But as Jeremiah is watching this vessel on the wheel being made, this spinning, he notices that something is starting to happen to the vessel. That the violence of the spin has begun to dry out the vessel on the wheel. See, the enemy knows that if I can't get you to give up, then I must get you to dry out. I'll let you come to revival, but I want you to come dry. See, y'all ain't saying nothing. I want you to walk up in this atmosphere but I want you to come in dry. See, 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 this is how you know you're dry. Because when Jeremiah's looking at the vessel, the dryness of the vessel, the vessel told on itself by becoming stiff. Yeah. 
What used to be pliable and moldable and movable, watch this, it vulnerable in the, in the presence of the potter is no longer the same way. What used to be crying and jumping, I'll put it in your world, dancing and shouting and running and serving and giving now sits in the same place, in the same way. Stiff. See, I'm talking to some people in this room that six months ago, six months ago, you used to be on fire for God. You used to give God everything you had. But along the way, the enemy introduced a spin and the spin has dried you out. You say things like, I dare you to move me. Start saying things like, it ain't nothing but a bunch of hype. He's too loud. It's too loud. You know it would be better if they did it like this. Y'all, I'm preaching better than you're letting on. <laughs> Stiff. Immodable. See, the enemy comes to dry you out because if he can't get your treasure, he wants your water. The most dangerous thing to the forces of darkness is water. Can I do this? Is this going to be too deep? You wonder how I know that? Ask Legion. Jesus shows up on the shore and demonic spirits, which by the way, go through dry places, the Bible says. <laughs> see, see, every demonic attack can only come when you're dry. If the devil dries you, it gives way for demonic forces to come in and operate and occupy. Jesus shows up on the shore. He looks at Legion and says, you got to go. And the demons say, hey, man. Hey, I'm paraphrasing. Hey, um, whatever you do, don't make us leave. If you're going to do anything... Uh, Put us in them pigs. I don't want you to notice so much that the demons went to the pigs as much as I want you to see where the pigs went when the demons got in them. The Bible says, oh, hallelujah, that the pigs ran and jumped and drowned in water. Why? Because even pigs know demons can't swim. I said, even the swine knew that demonic forces, when they come across the water of the spirit, cannot survive. They said, I'll drown it to drown it. I'll drown to drown it. See, that's why you got to get immersed in the river and in the ocean of God's presence. Because the deeper you go, the more you drown the forces of darkness in your life. Somebody go deep for 30 seconds right now. Drown it, drown it, drown it, drown that depression, drown that anxiety, drown that fear, drown that worry, drown that disease, drown that attack. I feel the Holy Ghost in this room. Somebody drown it. Drown that thing. I'm giving you permission. Drown it. That's why Jesus said, Jesus said, when the moment you got it, the moment you understand that there is a well on the inside of you, God said, I put a water source to let you combat every attack of the enemy on your life. I feel some on that right there. I feel some on that. Somebody just got a revelation that you don't have to live another day in another moment in the destruction of the enemy. All you got to do is jump headlong into some deeper water and you will drown that thing right off your life. Be seated. Let me finish. He caught almost I break it now in the name of Jesus. You've been trying to figure this thing out. How do I get it off my life? How do I stop the attack? How do I get rid of all the depression? How do I remove the anxiety? God says, go deeper. When he moved Ezekiel, he took him from waters that were ankle level to waters over his head. It looked like Ezekiel was drowned, but God was drowning what was holding on to Ezekiel. And by the way, if you really want to, can I do this? Y'all messing with me. 
by the way, y'all are pulling on some of the deepest revelation I have right now. By the way, when you start getting really deep in God, you will shift from river to ocean. I've heard a lot of talk in the body of Christ about the river of God, and I agree, you start in the river. But rivers don't stay rivers. Show me one river that just stays a river its entire existence. Every river empties into an ocean. Watch this. What is God trying to teach us? In the river, it's all about flow. But when you start getting deeper waters, you don't always feel the water moving because in deep waters, it's not about flow. It's about current. I feel like running in this room. I feel like running into some deeper water. I feel like moving into a deeper place in God. In, in, in rivers, it's about the flow of a thing. I feel. You feel flow. You don't always feel current. Let me tell you how you're growing up in God. And when you're really starting to mature in God. When it's not about how you feel. I don't feel it. No, no, no. I know you're in deep water when it's not about what you feel. But it's you praising God until it feels you. It's not what I feel, it's what's trying to feel me. Because, because, get it, can I go deeper? I got a well on the inside of me. The Bible says that God put Gideon on, not Gideon getting God on him. When the Spirit of the Lord came on Gideon, it was if God, it was as, it was if God was putting Gideon on like a coat. Because God wants to get to the place where you don't get him on you, he puts you on as his coat to wear in the community, in your job, in your family, and they looks like you, but really it's God going undercover. Be seated. Let me finish. Woo! Glory to God. Glory to God. Glory to God. Glory to God, glory to God, glory to God, glory to God, glory to God. Something's breaking open in this room. He calls so shot. Glory to God, glory to God, glory to God. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. I'm telling you, the devil is in trouble. If he would have known any better, he would have done his best to keep you in bed, taking you out on the way to get here, because by the end of this message, something's going to change in your life so significantly. You're about to go to another level and do more damage to the forces of darkness because you're going deeper in God. And Jeremiah says, get me back to Jeremiah, Lord. I've seen the stiffness of this vessel. I have one answer. Bring me water. Because the only way you become unstiff is by letting the water of the word be, watch this, applied to your life. Nothing will get down to the recesses of your heart and your spirit quicker then when a word from God is preached right down into your soul. Have you ever sat in a service and the preacher be preaching and all of a sudden you didn't know why, but you felt tears begin to well up in your eyes and your heart started beating fast and you thought God's doing something. He's doing it right now for somebody. He's thinking of us. Something's changing. I mean, see, that's when the water of the word has touched your soul and you are beginning to become pliable again and vulnerable again and you're becoming movable again and moldable again when the water of the word. But Jeremiah looked and there was a secondary problem. I promise I'm hurrying. He said, I didn't just notice it was stiff because of the spin, but I noticed that during the spin, the vessel was starting to get bent out of shape. Because what is it about the spin that has the power sometimes to bend you in directions and force you out of place and get you thinking ways you shouldn't think? And get you believing stuff about yourself you shouldn't believe. Bent, <laughs> bent, bent. The Bible would call this bending iniquity. 
iniquity, but he was bruised for my iniquity. He said, for the bending, I'll take bruising. Ah. What's, what's bruising? Bruising is the outward manifestation of inward bleeding. Because, because iniquity, the bending doesn't come from the outside. The bending happens from the inside out. Is that too deep? And Jeremiah said, do you, do you want more water to fix this? He said, no, I don't need water for this one. He said, all I need is my hand. Because sometimes God sends you his word. But there are some moments like in a revival weekend where he says, you don't need another word, you need my hand. And he'll walk up to you in an altar moment when you don't feel like anything's happening. And he'll start to put his hand on you. Oh, I don't know about you, but I'm grateful for the moments he put his hand on me. When I felt like I was spinning out of control, when I felt like I was about to bend and break, he just took his hand and he touched me. Oh, get us back to the place where we don't need to be touched by men. We need a touch from heaven. God, touch us again. Move every bent place and broken place and hurting place back into alignment. Touch us, oh God. We won't refuse your hand, but we'll welcome your hand into our lives. Touch us again, oh God. Somebody can come to the keys. And the Bible says, watch this. He made it. He made it. Making something. But the verse after that, the last verse says, Jeremiah's watching and something bad has happened. Because despite all the answers I just gave you, something problematic has happened. The Bible says that the clay was marred in the hand of the potter. It showed me that you could be in his hand and be insecure. It showed me that you could be, watch this, on the praise team and jealous. You could be a greeter and still have issues with people. So what did the potter do? He, re he, he reached down, picked it up, and he threw it away. No, that's not what he did. That's what we do. What is it about us that when the, when the vessel doesn't match up to what we thought it should be by now, we just take it off the wheel and discard it? But can I tell you, God is not that way. God does not discard. In fact, your God is a dumpster diver. God will go looking for trash because though it might be your trash, it's still God's treasure in the trash. And God will dumpster dive. See, some of us are a product of God's dumpster diving abilities. We are the product of God being able to go to the lowest of lows, to go to the darkest of darks and reach down and grab us and still say I know they don't see it but I still see it no matter how badly you've been marred and the text said I'm done and he made it again another vessel wait a second I read that and I got lost he made it another how is it it and another at the same time because in my world, it's either got to be it or. But then I thought about what happens when you really get saved. It's you. But by the time he's done, it's another you. God didn't change your face. He didn't change your address. He didn't change any of that. No, no, no. When God really gets in your life, he will take you and make you again into another. That by the time he's done, people see, because some of the people in order to get, get saved need to know the reference point. They need to know you when you were down and out so they can understand God when you're up and out. And he made it again into another stand to your feet everybody this is it pastor paul when god gave me this word i got down to verse four and as an expository preacher as an expository revelatory preacher i understood that once i empty the scripture i'm done with the text and if i want to preach more i need to find another verse or go to the next verse 
and there wasn't anything in the next verse, so I shut my Bible. And I began to walk away. I closed the book, and I said, I'm finished. Thank you, Lord, for your word. And all of a sudden, I got to the doorway of my study, and the Lord rebuked me. He said, where are you going? He said, I'm not done talking. He said, Josh, you missed the most important revelation of the entire text. I said, how, God? I have drained this thing. Every part of the making at the wheel, making something. I have, expo I have exposed the process. What did I miss? He said, you missed the most important part. I said, Lord, how, how could I have missed it? I, 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 I was there with the spinning. I was there with the thing. I got you when you picked it up. I got you all the way to the making something. He said, Josh, what never changed? I said, what never changed? The whole text is about change. He said, what was the constant in the text? I said, you wrote it, do you not know? <laughs> but I went back to the moment he picked it up, all the way to the moment he made it again. And there was one constant in the whole text that no matter where the clay was in the process, it never left his hand. Oh. Oh. No matter from the moment he grabbed it and walked it into the house to the moment he set it down his hand never left the clay the hand never left the clay and God sent me in this room to let you know something that the devil has been scared to death for you to find out because God sent me here to tell you that he didn't pick you up then to let you go now that he might not have felt his hand but his hand has always been there in your life God has been moving molding and protecting you and if God had his hand on you now he'll have his hand on you forever and ever and ever God's got you he didn't pick you up then to let you go now I want to talk to somebody real soft in the room that has felt lost as I was talking about different parts of this vessel stiff and bent broken God sent me here for you to let you know he didn't pick you up then to let you go now every head bowed every eye closed I feel the anointing I feel the anointing of God in this room the first group of people I want to talk to you know most you're in this room and Maybe you walked away from God. You're in this room. You don't know the Lord. Maybe you did once in your life, but maybe you've walked away and you just so happened to come to church. Maybe you've been coming to this church the whole time, but you, you've never really given your life wholeheartedly to Christ. And you say, it's time to come back. I hear the Lord. I hear the Lord so clear on this Sunday morning. He wants the backslider to come home. He wants the, those that don't know him to come into, the, come into the house. You're not too dirty, my friend. You haven't gone too far. You've not done too much. God is waiting on you at this altar. He had me preach this message just for you. He's begging you. Begging the backslider. Begging the non-believer. Come. I came to tell you he loves you. Every head bowed, every eye closed, nobody looking, nobody moving for just a second. You're in this room and you don't know Jesus. You're in this room and maybe you've been saved and you've walked away in your faith or maybe you've backslidden in your faith and you'd say, today I gotta get it right. I don't wanna leave, I'm not, I know Pastor Josh, I'm not promised tomorrow, I, I, I gotta make it right. I gotta make, for my future, I gotta get it right. I gotta get in alignment with God, I gotta get it right. By his son, Jesus already came, this is the gospel, my friend, and gave his life for you, that you could come back to the Father anytime. The door is wide open this morning for you, and on the count of three, if you're in this room, you're backslidden, or you need to accept Jesus Christ into your heart, I came if it was just for one, but I feel like there are, I feel like 
like there are many in this room that need to come back to Jesus. On the count of three, I want you to get to this altar. You need to rededicate your life to Christ. You need to give your life to Jesus. On the count of three, come. One, hallelujah, hallelujah. Come on, saints, pray. I feel the anointing of God. Come home. God's saying, come home, come home, come into the house. Two, if that's you, don't you hesitate. Come to this altar. Don't you hesitate. It's not about worrying what people think. Come to this altar. Three, if it's you, come. Come back home. Come back home. Praise God, they're coming. Praise God, they're coming. Come back home. Come back home. Come back home. Come back home. I'll wait for you. I'll wait for you. Meet me right here. Meet me right here. There ain't no shame in your game. There ain't no shame in your game. Come. Come home. Come on. I bet you if you stay clapping, they'll keep coming. Come on. Come to the backslider. Come to the person not living without Jesus. Come. I feel salvation in this room. Come. My God, this is revival. Stay clapping for a start. I bet you they'll keep coming. Come. We're not angry. We're not embarrassed. Come. I cannot get away from this. There is somebody in this room. You've been wrestling. God says, come, come. He loves you. He loves you. That's it. That's it. That's it. That's it. That's it. That's it. it. I'll wait on you for a couple of minutes. I don't know who I'm talking to. Get out of your seat and come. Come on. We're for you. We're for you. Today is the day of salvation. God has come in this house to tell you that he didn't pick you up over there to let you go now. Your dreams aren't dead. God is not disgusted. He is madly in love with you. This is the gospel. (laughs) 30 seconds, because I cannot, Pastor Paul, I'm trying, I'm really trying, but I just sense somebody in this room, you got to come back. You got to come back. You got to come back. Come, come. I don't know who I'm waiting on. Come on, don't, 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 don't wait another moment. Don't wait another moment. Come, 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 come. Who am I waiting on? Who am I waiting on? Get out of your seat and come. I feel so stirred in my spirit. It's time to give it back to him. You got 15 seconds. I don't know who you are, but God has given you another opportunity. I hear you, Lord. You said if they give me another chance, I'm going to go. Who am I talking to? Come. 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 Five seconds. Four seconds. Who am I talking to? Three. Come on. Come on. Come on, man of God. Come on. This is revival! Can we call it revival if nothing gets revived? Came today? Give me a hand, sweetheart. Today's a brand new day for you. You've been through a lot. You've had to fight a lot to get to this moment. But let me just tell you, he didn't pick you up then to let you go now. God's got a great plan for you. Jesus, touch my friend. She's your friend too. Great future in front of you. You didn't lose anything. God said he still has it all prepared for you. Just the way. Just the way it needs to be. You're at this altar. Can I get staff and deacons and those of you who are mature? I want every person with somebody with them or behind them. I was going to go a different way, but God has totally switched this moment. Is this not what we came for? I'm going to get to you in a minute, but, but heaven just got a little bigger and hell just got a little smaller.
I want you, for the person that's standing on my, just reach out and touch their shoulders. Reach out and touch their shoulders. If you're at this altar and you want to give your life to Jesus, you came to give your life to Jesus, just look up here at me for one second. Today is the greatest day of your life. Today's the greatest day of your life. Give me a hand. I just want to hold you. I just, see, this is why I'll die for this. I'll die for this. To see somebody come into the kingdom. You're at this altar, let me tell you, today is a day of salvation. We're about to pray a prayer, and please know there's no power in the prayer, but there's a power in the heart that believes the prayer that's being prayed. When you pray this prayer, you're going to ask Jesus to come live on the inside of you, and you're going to live your life for him because he's in you. Are you ready to pray this prayer? I want the whole church, we're going to pray it together as loud as we can. If you're at this altar, I want you to say it loud and say it proud. You didn't come this far now not, not to be bold in your faith. Come on, are you all ready? Are we ready for a start? Say, dear Jesus, today I ask you to come into my heart, to come and live on the inside of me. I say I'm sorry for my sin and for every place that I wronged you. Jesus, thank you for dying on the cross. Thank you for your blood. Thank you for saving me. I tell you now that I'll live the rest of my life serving you, loving you, and building your kingdom. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, I said in Jesus' name, if you believe it, somebody shout with me right now. Now let me do one final thing. You're at this altar. Hear me. You need to come back and get baptized and take your faith public. You need to, watch this, you need to get plugged into the church. You need to be in the Bible. You need to go get a Bible. And you need to get in a deeper group, right? Is it called deeper classes and group? You need to be a part. Remember, he sets you right in the center of the will. No time wasted with God. He loves you. Now, I want us, fresh start, I want us to give God glory for the lives that were not only saved, but finally, the word of God that has come to your heart today to tell you that he didn't pick you up then to let you go now. I came to prophesy a future to you that you never dreamed you could have. Why? Because you have never left his hand. If you're ready for the future, if you're ready to see the expected end of God on your life, slip up your hands. And I want us to take the last 60 seconds of this service and I want us to be grateful to God. I want us to be thankful to God. This is revival, my friends. This is, this is revival. You, be, you come back tonight, I'm telling you, the Holy Ghost is going to explode up in this place. But right now, I feel like God is saying, just be grateful. Just be thankful. I will enter his gates with thanksgiving in my heart. You're at this altar. You say, what am I supposed to do, Pastor Josh? Just lift up your hands and start saying, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Are you ready? The last 60 seconds. Open up your mouth all across this room. Come on and begin to be grateful with a grateful heart and a grateful spirit. We say thank you. Thank you for your hand. Thank you for molding us. Thank you for making us. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Come on, be grateful. Be grateful. Be grateful for every blessing, for every moment he picks you up. Come on, you got 30 seconds. I just, want to, I just want to welcome all of you to the family of God today. I want to welcome you to your Fresh Start family today.
and just let you know that we're committed to helping you to move from a fresh start to a strong finish. And so that these bags that they're handing out are, are, are fresh start bags and you're going to find in that bag, you're going to find a Bible. If you don't have a Bible, a New Believer's Bible and some other things that's going to help you have a greater understanding of what just took place in your life. And Pastor Josh just mentioned about being water baptized. We're going to be doing that here on Wednesday night. And all you need to do to get ready for that is to go right over here where this gentleman is standing. And there's a, there's a place where you can just sign up. And you can just sign up and they'd be here Wednesday night and go through the water baptism. Amen. And that's just making a public declaration of an inward encounter you've had with Jesus Christ today. Amen. Amen. And I want you to know we're so proud of you. And we're so thankful for the work of God that he's doing in your life right now. I want you to know we really believe that you will never be the same. That you've experienced a change in your life. Old things have passed away. All things have become new. Because you've encountered the love of Jesus today. Amen. And we're so proud of you. And we love you so much. And we just want to continue to be here and be a part of what God is doing in your life. Can I get an amen from Fresh Start Church today? So let me just say a prayer over you. Father, I just thank you for all of these this morning. They had made a, a, a first-time commitment, Lord. Or maybe, Lord, they, it's been a long time, but they've come. They've come back home. And, Lord, I just pray right now you would seal the work of the Holy Spirit upon their lives and that they would never be the same again, Father. And, Lord, the word that has gone deep and the word that spoke to them and the word that was released into this house and into the hearts of your people, Lord, that it will bear much fruit and there will be a mighty work, of your, a deep work of your Spirit in our lives in this place. And we give you praise and we thank you for it, Father. And the church said...